Trek to Yomi is, to me, an unexpected game from developer Flying Wild Hog. Known for the Shadow Warrior series, this stylish side-scroller is so far removed from that world it's unrecognizable. Shadow Warrior 3 featured colorful graphics, over-the-top combat, and dick jokes every five minutes. Trek to Yomi features none of this, going for a more grounded approach with a moody atmosphere and a serious, focused storyline. From the moment I booted the game up, Trek to Yomi's art direction stunned me. The lack of color gives the world a drab, dreary, hopeless appearance that I dig a lot. Many people are going to see this game and compare it to Sony's Ghost of Tsushima, and that's fair, but I think a more fair comparison is to Inside. Both games primarily feature fixed camera angles with panning shots for times of movement across, say, bridges or rooftops. I especially loved the scenes where there was a lack of light on the character, so all you see are silhouettes of warriors and their weapons. Every frame in this game is screenshot worthy. I would frequently stop what I was doing just to position Hiroki in a spot I like. I like how the HUD, menus, and other UI elements all stay out of the way and allow the visuals to stand front and center without distraction. Further adding to that atmosphere is the sound design. Trek to Yomi is best played with headphones. The soundtrack is brooding, dark, atmospheric, and adds to the immersion. There's only one voiceover option as well, Japanese, and the rest of the language options are subs only. I like this and it adds to the authenticity of the game. The team consulted with Japanese historians, musicians, architects, and more to recreate a more authentic Edo period Japan. And look guys, I'm no expert on any of this stuff and I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be, but I'm just impressed by the lengths that the devs went through to get this level of authenticity translated to the game. Trek to Yomi is primarily a side-scroller, at least in combat scenarios. Outside of them, you'll be free to roam around a mostly linear 3D world. You're able to deviate from the linear structure in search of shrines, collectibles, ammo, health, and stamina upgrades. Shrines not only serve as your save point, but they also fill your health bar. I didn't collect everything in the game on my first playthrough, but I felt I had plenty of health and stamina just by finding what I could scattered around. In addition, in addition to those deviations I mentioned earlier, you can completely avoid some combat scenarios entirely if you'd like. So here's an example I'm going to show you guys. On my first run, I didn't notice this ladder at all here, and I just ran at these guys and killed them all. Only when I backtracked did I notice I could drop this pallet of rocks on them. So I went ahead and I reloaded to the last checkpoint and gave it a go. <laughs> it's not available for every encounter, but for the times it was available, I just had to activate the trap. Adding to that variety, later on in the game, there are these simple puzzles where you have to match the kanji in the environment with the ones on these rotating stones. These were pretty simple and only popped up three or four times in total. I like the fact that they were included, but I would have liked to see even more puzzles and even more variety given to those puzzles. Alright, enough about puzzles, it's finally time to talk about the combat. Being a side-scroller, you can only attack left or right. Most of your attacks come from your blade. Heavy attacks are slower, but deal more damage. Weak attacks are faster, but they deal less damage. You're also able to block incoming attacks, and if timed correctly, you can parry them as well, which opens enemies up for a swift counter-attack. I thought the timing was a bit weird on parries and counters. Sometimes I felt like I could spam the parry button and pull them off, and then there were other times I felt like I needed to wait for just that right time to parry and counter, and even then, I'd take a hit here and there. As you progress, you learn more combos to add to your repertoire. Some combos will end with a heavy strike, some of them break blocks, others will end by stunning your opponent and opening them up for a finishing blow. Finishers are these cinematic executions that refill a bit of your health. They became crucial to me later on in the game as enemies began to hit harder and be thrown at me in larger numbers. By the end, I sort of knew which combos I liked and stuck to them for the most part. Swordplay isn't your only option in the game though, you also get a few ranged weapons to play around with, with varying degrees degrees of range, power, and speed of use. You get bow shudikens first. These are the weakest throwables in the game, but also the fastest to use. I typically use these to slow an approaching enemy down and reduce the amount of hits I'd need to land on them with my sword. Next up, the bow is a nice middle ground between power and speed. You're able to one-shot all grunts and most of the armored enemies. Finally, you unlock access to the Ozutsu, this gun that takes forever to load, but packs a huge punch. One shot will kill every enemy you aim it at, except for bosses. The round pierces right through them. There's actually an achievement for killing three enemies with one shot, that was really cool to pull off. <laughs> 
Other than fighting grunts, you also encounter the occasional boss fight in Tractiomi. I enjoyed the bosses that used weapons similar to mine, katana, staff, spears, etc. They played by the rules of sword play and I was able to more effectively dodge and counter their attacks when needed. I don't want to show any of the later game bosses, but they do get a bit ridiculous with their attacks and I didn't find them all that engaging to fight. There are four difficulties in total, Kabuki, Bushido, Ronin, and Kensei. The core difference between the first three are the health pools of your enemies. Kabuki being the lowest, Ronin being the highest. Kensei is only unlockable once you beat the game and allows you to one-shot everything except bosses, with the caveat being everything can one-shot you as well. I'll be honest, this mode sort of invalidates a few of the mechanics of the game while highlighting others. For example, now that every hit is a kill, bow shurikens become the most valuable ranged weapon. Also, when fighting grunts, combos become a thing of the past. Most of the time you'll stand around and wait for the enemy to rush at you so you can time a block or a swift attack. It forces you to really master the gameplay. This might be for some, but it wasn't for me. I made it just about halfway through the game before putting it down. I would have really liked to see a new game plus mode here. That way I could focus primarily on mastering the late game combos and I could disregard most of the exploration on this playthrough. I played the game on PC on my 8700K and 3080 and I ran the game at two different resolutions, 1440p and 4k to test the game out. 1440p ran 100% fine, but I did experience some micro stutters at 4k, but once I turned the settings down from epic to high, the micro stutter vanished. I did experience one crash during my playthrough and a few bizarre bugs, but nothing too game breaking. I'm sure the devs will fix the issue shortly if they haven't already. Now, I haven't really talked about the story at all and that was my intention. I want to be as vague as possible because I think you guys should experience the game yourself for the first time. Essentially, the game is a pretty straightforward revenge story with one large deviation that occurs about halfway through the game. Trek to Yomi has a few different endings that are triggered with different dialogue options. The endings from a gameplay perspective don't change, but dialogue and cutscenes do change. And unfortunately, there's no level select, so to see any of the other endings, you'll either have to replay the game two additional times or look them up like I did. I know the game was designed to be replayed a few times, but personally, I almost never replay a game immediately after beating it. I prefer to give it a few years and then I come back to check it out again. The game is quite short and that's going to be the, the thing that pushes people away. Uh, my playthrough with Death took me about four hours, so I'm guessing the game is probably three and a half, maybe three if you skip all of the cutscenes, so your mileage there may vary. Wrapping things up, Trek to Yomi is a beautiful, brooding game. It may be a bit too short for some, especially with its $20 price tag, but I felt that the visuals, atmosphere, and gameplay more than justified the asking price. Trek to Yomi had me entertained from start to finish, and that's why Trek to Yomi is my game of the year. So far. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Typically I review older games in this channel, but I thought this time I would mix it up a bit. I'm really new to this whole video review thing and I'm still looking for constructive criticism going forward. If you have any game suggestions as well, please, I'm open to those too. So drop your suggestions and criticisms in the comments. Thank you again for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.